Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. And today we've got a great topic. I brought together a couple of young leaders who are going to join us to reflect on looking at Mexico through foreign eyes. Mexico, of course, is an important neighbor to the south of the U.S., uh, part of the Asia-Pacific region. we got to sometimes remind the Asia components that there are some partners over here. But um, today I'm joined by two uh, uh, young uh, uh, students that are currently studying abroad in Mexico, uh, Davin Baxter uh, and Oliver Owen. Uh, and so let me just briefly welcome both of you. Thank you for joining me today here on Global Connections, a chance to carry out an interesting conversation. Let me ask each of you just to give us a brief introduction. Tell us uh, where you're from and, and you're both students in Mexico. What is it you're studying either in Mexico or at, at a home institution? So starting with you, uh, Oliver, go ahead, Oliver. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Oliver. Uh, thank you for having me. Um... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, ish, I'm from Manchester, England, but I uh, originally studied at uh, the University of, of East Anglia in Norwich, and uh, I'm here in Puebla and uh, uh, Udlap studying uh, international relations and modern history. Excellent. Thank you. And Davin, go ahead. Hey, what's going on? Uh, yeah, once again, to follow up on Oliver, thank you so much for having us. It's, uh, it's a huge honor. Um, so yeah, my name is Davin. I was originally born in Guam, USA. And I've been living in different places pretty much ever since. Uh, at the moment, living in Puebla, Mexico, and studying international relations all time. Excellent. Well, thank you both. And uh, I, I'm glad you reminded me about Guam because, as you know, the, the show we're doing today here is Everybody Think Tech Hawaii. And it helps to bridge both all of the Asia Pacific region. And, uh, you know, I have opportunities to join you here. Often I'm in Mexico. At the moment, I'm actually in central Texas in Austin, uh, m moving. And, and so, little out of my own comfort zone, but it also, it's always valuable because as you all know, I've been living in Mexico several years teaching there. And uh, both of you have, uh, have, I think, give us an example or what are some of the opportunities or challenges for international education? And uh, what I mean by that is you have opportunities to study in other countries, to, to even do degrees in other places. Uh, Davin, you've got uh, now a connection into Mexico for some time as you're pursuing this uh, and with you, Oliver, perhaps a, a short-term uh, engagement, you know, and it, it is uh, obviously coming also at a very interesting time during this massive global pandemic, uh, presenting different challenges. But let me uh, begin just uh, in, in terms of understanding, you know, global learning, global education uh, is obviously a wide range of things, but it includes the opportunities that today young, young students like you have for mobility. Uh, let me put it clearly, when I was a college student 40 years ago, I mean, yes, you could do a study abroad. It was rare. It wasn't easy. There was simply, it wasn't as, as easy as it is today. But let me ask each of you, maybe offer some initial reflections. Uh, you've now been in Mexico some time studying. Obviously, like students all over the world, it's increasingly online at the moment and, and gradually will ease back. But uh, And yet you're still experiencing living and, and you know, and, and basically studying in a foreign country. So just beginning with the idea, I mean, what interested you in it? And then uh, perhaps starting with Oliver, since you've come the farthest, uh, uh, here you are in, in England studying in East Anglia, and suddenly it's, you get this idea to venture off and make your way to Mexico. I mean, what sparked your interest? And then just briefly, how was the arrival? I mean, what were some some initial thoughts on, on how it went for you coming over? Um, I think what initially sparked the interest was um, just in, in general, in, interest in Mexico, interest in Mexican culture, and the, uh, I guess, one of my major interests academically also is the um, history and politics of uh, the Latin America region, which uh, is not really something we really get the chance to talk about um, or to study academically in, in the UK. So that was a major motivation for me to do a study abroad, but also, um, also I wanted to, I really want, wanted to learn the Spanish language, uh, which was a but huge, huge, huge motivate, motivator for me. Obviously, arriving here, you realize, oh, I'm, um, you know, you, you're learning Mexican Spanish, not, <laughs> not Spanish Spanish. So when I, when I've um, talk, talking to uh, friend, other Spanish speaking friends that I've met in university back home, they they they, they, they speak to me like, what is your accent? <laughs> what are these words you're saying to me? Yeah, um, but but it's been. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's been a great experience. It was initially quite um, a scary experience because obviously arriving during the pandemic, um, it's it's just it, it's a totally different experience than you'd imagine. Um, because I mean, you, usually it's um, everything. You know, you you arrive, you go into your sort of university accommodation, uh, everything um, everything's done for you. Whereas, or, or that's what you'd imagine. Whereas because of the pandemic, I arrived and didn't have a, you know. Full like 
permanent accommodation when I first arrived. Uh, everything was shut down when I, when I arrived in Mexico City. Uh, so the first, I would say, uh, one or two months were a little bit precarious, uh, a, little, a little bit of a weird situation. Um, eventually, I did. I found, um, you know, I found a nice uh, student housing company. Uh, I, mo I moved into a house with, with a mix of, you know, international students and uh, other Mex and Mexicans. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. But yeah, I, arriving here was um, an interesting experience, to say the least. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I can assure you, even though it may not be obvious to you, you are developing the kind of life skills, adaptability, resiliency, dealing with, you know, uncertainty, frustrations, uh, and solving the basic needs. Because, yeah, I mean, it's hard enough studying abroad under normal circumstances, culture shock and, you know, a new system. Add to that just, the, you know, the, the crisis of a pandemic. And, you know, we'll get more to talk a little moment about how Mexico has been dealing with that, because it, like every place, it kind of it depends. It depends on where you are, certain communities, maybe the, even Mexico as a federal system, the states are kind of taking a leading role in coordinating their responses. But let's continue, Dev, and uh, you yourself, I mean, you, you did mention earlier, you, you've had sort of a, a movement around, but what is it that prompted you to find a way to Mexico and how has yours been? I mean, you've been in Mexico a bit longer, perhaps, so you've seen it from where it was pre-pandemic and now through the pandemic. So give us an update. Completely different world, yeah. yeah. Um, so I originally came to Mexico because of my mom, actually, we were living in Ankara, Turkey prior to this, and she's a, she's a diplomat. So she works in the foreign service and she got a job at uh, the U S embassy in Mexico city. And I had just completed high school in Ankara, took a gap year, was working two jobs there. And, uh, it, the time had come to where she needed to start her new assignment. And she basically extended the offer on to me. It was pretty much between coming to Mexico or going back to the States and starting my university career. And after giving, uh, you know, just a general look at all the different schools that I could have went to in the, in the States and one particular school that I, we had found in Mexico City, we determined that like the quality of education was going to be more or less the same, but it was significantly cheaper to study in Mexico. So plus, I mean, of course, just like the whole cultural, new cultural experience, picking up a new language. I feel like coming to Mexico was definitely the, I don't know, the more, the, 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 the smarter option for me. I mean, yeah, to get the most benefit out of, out of traveling and getting to mo know, getting to know more out of the world. And yeah, so. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you've effectively, as you said earlier, you've been able to experience Mexico coming and initially studying in the pre-pandemic time and witnessing this transformation. And of course, uh, that I can imagine has been dramatic. So perhaps on that, let me ask, and, and you can follow up right now to continue with that, Devin. I mean, what are some takeaways? I mean, you know, I don't know whether they're just impressions, but in terms of how it came down uh, now more than a year ago, and uh, like every place else, it's going through its phases, transitions, and, you know, we're hopeful that in the coming months, things are going to look better. It's not as bad as it was at one time, but it still remains, you know, a work in progress. But share with us any of your own experiences, uh, either. Oh, I still remember when no one was taking it seriously. Like, what, what was it, February and March? After um, China was already looking pretty bad. And there were some cases uh, sparking up around, like, the Asia region. And I think, like, Europe had just started seeing a few cases. Um, people in Mexico still weren't taking it very seriously. They were very, pretty, everybody was pretty much like, oh, yeah, well, you know. It's just going to be like a common flu. People are going to look better after about two weeks. And I remember when the media censorship was very, we had to go through like different mediums to find like these different videos that people were taking within that state of how like serious the situation was. And lots of places, the entire cities looked like complete ghost towns. So when that finally came and hit Mexico, Lots of people got really scared. Uh, lots of people had to go back to their home states. And I don't want to say it changed overnight, but it, it was a gradual process. But you could definitely see uh, the procedural effects of that. And yeah, I guess it wasn't until summer when you really could recognize that, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting pretty bad. And Mexico City got hit hard. Puebla got hit hard. Uh, different parts, I mean, it, it essentially engulfed the entire republic. And one of the challenges, I mean, this is true in many places, but especially, let's say, a country like Mexico, where you've got, uh, how shall I say, I mean, a media that is, in, you know, in transition, and it's hard, well, 
bottom line is I want to say it's hard to get good information to know, you know, accurate information sometimes. Uh, and I say that because often, let's say in the, in the in the more developed world, I mean, you've got some major sources you will turn to, knowing kind of where they fit in, and some of them are more credible, reliable. And I'm, you know, again speaking as an outsider here, that Mexico often there's a lot of uh, very much, you know, sensationalized and and you know, and, and there's a tendency towards a lot of conspiracy theories and rumors, a lot of distrust of government for 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 good reason, as as it has a long history often of of you know mismanagement, corruption, and the like. So. Just that, um, and so you, you've been through it. You, you've shared the, you've seen the transition. Like suddenly, it's a different world, uh, as you described, uh, in, in when, when it, people finally took it seriously. Um, and yet, by contrast, in your case, Ollie, you you came and literally arrived into a pandemic scenario. Um, maybe from your vantage point, because again, you're also different, coming from the UK. Uh, let's say a different mindset, political culture, even you know the, the way public health and, and, and healthcare in general works is a lot more. You know, in the U.S., we might say socialized or at least more, you know, uniform. Uh, and I can tell you, like, from the United States and, and my own vantage point, both family in Texas and Hawaii and, and California, every place is different how they handle it and, and, and you know, what they've done. And we've seen that variation. Um, uh, I'm just curious if you might just say, offer some thoughts, uh, Ollie, on what did you see in terms of either things that were working or that weren't working, puzzles, confusion, or things that you said, gosh, why don't they do it this way? Or maybe, wow, that's a different way of doing it that seems, you know, interesting. Uh, and any Anything like that you can share? Um, it, it's, it seems to me, I mean, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not really of the belief that England has really dealt with, really dealt with it very well. Um, but... Um, there, there are certain things that I found quite contradictory about uh, Mexico's response uh, to the pandemic. So, for example, um, it, it, some, something that I mean, when, when I talked to Mexicans before, um, before I arrived here, they kind of described it to me almost as if it was like the Wild West, nobody cares, some things, some stuff like that. Whereas when I arrived, the thing that surprised me was that people, at least you see people in the street and the people in uh, stores and stuff like that, uh, people are abiding by the rules. You know they have the they, they have the system of masks. They have the um, you know everyone's everyone's getting the temperatures taken. Everything is getting everyone's getting you know hands hand sanitized and stuff like that. Which which surprised me that people uh, you know would take are taking it so seriously in in that sense. Um, but and it is it, it was way better compared to um, how it was in England. In England, um, because I think. I don't know. I people people say it's this sort of, um, I guess, Anglo-Saxon mentality of the government can't tell me what to do, <laughs> stuff like that. So you go into stores, the stores, and you see half the people not wearing masks and stuff like that. Um, not not everywhere, obviously. There are a lot of a lot of people that are abiding by the rules. But the thing that I found contradictory is that um, you have this kind of thing in Mexico, and yet at the same uh, at the same time stuff like for example large social gatherings uh in private settings it doesn't seem to me like there's been any sort of regulation on that whereas for example um in in the uk i mean uh you can get fined up to ten thousand pounds if you get caught you know hosting a party a party or something like that um and it just seems it it, it does seem it just seemed a bit very con contradictory this uh, the sense that in the i guess the uh, public sphere, everyone very much abides by the rules and, and the strict regulations, strict codes in, in line. But in sort of in, in more in, in more private settings, which arguably could be more dangerous, you know, um, large, large social gatherings, there doesn't even seem to be much of a, you know, like taboo on it about, uh, you know, hosting large social gatherings um, privately. And I've just that was the main difference that I've noticed between England and Mexico. Yeah, interesting. And and the, you know, you reflect that uh, it speaks in some ways to you know Mexican culture and society often is described as you know people will put on a mask or they'll have a very different you know identity and and maybe reality within their family and and you know close you know circle uh, and to the outside world. And so what you're describing is you know everybody is doing their you know sort of I guess their citizenship responsibility. On the other hand, it's difficult for them because they're very social and there's a lot of, you know, uh, gatherings, you know, the social gatherings are, and, and even, you know, a public displays of affection, a lot of kissing and hugging. It's difficult to take that away. Uh, whereas, again, maybe Latin Americans would look at the British and say, well, they're stuffy anyway. It's you know, easy for them to just, you know, somehow stay 
uh, isolated and remote. Uh, again, that, that's a terrible thing to say, but uh, uh, but but the point being that, yeah, in, in the Latin American culture in Mexico, I mean, just the idea that people are not as independent and autonomous and, and family is such an important part that it means literally, you know, multi-generational and your cousins, your aunts, the whole clan and, and then and so on. Um, let's, uh, I mean, uh, maybe uh, anything that you could add to the, uh, Davin, though, just in terms of things that have been, like, we, we heard from other paradoxes, puzzles, things that either surprised you. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I can't say that it surprised me because I feel like a lot of different countries were doing this, but um, how Mexico just kind of got caught with uh, severely uh, undercounting the coronavirus-related deaths. And I think the estimates were somewhere around uh, seven times higher than what the number, what the, what the official numbers were purporting. So, I mean, I feel like countries do this for a number of different re reasons. Either they exaggerate the numbers or they underestimate them, uh, either to receive more aid or perhaps to prevent, to do what they can to prevent uh, the potential collapse of certain economic industries. Uh, but to me, when I saw those numbers and I see the reality of the situation, um, it's, it's just kind of sad. And it is. I think in Mexico, it came out a few months ago that suddenly, overnight, they suddenly announced that, oh, my gosh, we've been undercounting, you know, by four or five times. Or surprise, something. surprise. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and many people have been saying, well, wait a minute, there are other methods, you know, just counting the, uh, and I think that's what came out, the methodologies, you know, uh, counting the morgues and count, and then that many people are dying at home, never reporting it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's just, they're you know, there took a lot of criticism. And the, the challenge there is it can erode a lot of legitimacy or trust in the government if suddenly they don't handle it well. Uh, and it further erodes, again, you know, a lot of the skepticism people may have. Um, but uh, that, that is the challenge. And Mexico, again, uh, even today remains, you know, together with Brazil and India and the U.S., these are the major, major players of, of uh, infections and, and, and death. Uh, and, uh, well, so that, that continues. Now, let me uh, move us on and maybe continue the dialogue, because uh, as students of, of, you know, sort of international affairs, international relations, you know, global politics and the like, you're also observers of what's happening in Mexico. And at times uh, we've had on the show opportunities to talk about complex interdependence between the U.S. and Mexico, of course, of major trade relations, you know, human mobility, migration and the like. Um, and there's also this important, you know, moment where Mexico has this leader at the moment, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who... You know, many, uh, even in the international arena, have often been critical of him, a populist leader among those who was sort of strongly downplaying the COVID itself in, in the early phases. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, having your own ideas, and, and in your case, all of you had some preconceived ideas and, you know, interest in, in let's say, Mexico, then, you know, what you see, and, and maybe is there a disconnect, or do you see things on the ground or living and experiencing Mexico that, you know, dispel some of the, or do, that maybe uh, make clear there are misperceptions or that they simply, you know, or can you see that the, those images, you know, those perceptions are based on, you know, reality? Uh, I don't know. Just uh, what are your impressions again, again, about maybe what's happening in Mexico, the political change, political dynamics, and you, you, you've seen the end of the Trump era, which was a tense moment. We now have the new Biden administration, and yet it's not as if it's the friendliest. Uh, the relations remain still pretty tense. Uh, and in Mexico, again, it, it's a tough time. The economy has taken a suffering. The political dynamics are also in flux. There's an upcoming uh, sort of midterm election this next month. And uh, the president continues to have a majority in the Congress in both uh, chambers and, and is expected to win. But that doesn't change, you know, that there are still a lot of dynamics going on. So any reflections on, again, current Mexican politics and your observations, uh, Ali? Um, well, it, it, it was just interesting to come to Mexico and I guess, um, because, yeah, I, 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 I guess back home, we do have some idea of uh, who AMLO is, but it's, it's it's very much packaged into the whole idea of he's, oh, it's Mexican Trump, you know, because <laughs> it's very, it's very easy, it's very easy to do that or, or, you know, Mexican Bolsonaro or something like that, whereas, you know, obviously he's, he's somewhat um at least for observers back home he's somewhat contradictory in that he's you know this sort of uh you know populist figure but he's also a, you know a self-described um uh, he's, he's also a self-described left winger i'm fairly sure he has a background in uh something something to do with um you know indigenous mexican languages or something something like that uh if, if i remember reading that correctly so it's not it's not necessarily i, I guess people back home the uh image of the popular the you know big you know macho populist leader um that some people expect 
but it's just been it's it's been interesting to me to um, listen to the uh, views of different Mexicans on AMLO, because from 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 one hand you get the more uh, the view of AMLO that is, that is more kind of popular in international media that you know he's a bit of a you know he's a show he's a showman he's a bit silly you know um, had had the whole thing of him shake you know um, shaking hands and stuff like that during the height of the pandemic. Um, and I, I, I guess there's sort of a very critical view. And then hearing other views of um, um, ordinary Mexicans saying, yes, he has his problems. He's not, a, you know, he's uh, not perfect, but, you know, he's better than what we've had or, or, or that um, he's uh, some I've heard that some people could sort of perceive him to be uh, less corrupt than, and, than, than sort of other uh, more establishment pro- politicians that might be linked to uh, uh, like PRI or something like that. So I, that that's what that's the, the thing that's been very in, very interesting to me. Just interesting for me just to see the complete contrast in views between Mexicans because there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any Mexicans to me that are in the middle on AMLO. It's either you, you like him or you don't. <laughs> it's a bit like yeah. Marmite, you know. <laughs> it is, and he is a polarizing figure in that respect. And so and and you know he's appealed because he's also addressing concerns and issues that have not, never been on the agenda, marginalized communities, or at least not at the top. So, you know, he's, he's populist in that regard. He's trying to shift everything. But others that really see him as, uh, you, know, you know, and yet the interesting thing is the opposition, if we can call it that, is completely disorganized, not coherent, doesn't have a, a, a plan. It's more like they just don't like him. And they bring together parties from the right, from the left, from the center, evangelicals, just this garbled up opposition. Meanwhile, you know, he does have, again, a continued majority. But, uh, Devin, again, you, you've been able to see it maybe in a, a more slightly longer venue, both as maybe, uh, I'm not sure how long, how many years in Mexico, but you've seen AMLO kind of progressing and now dealing through the pandemic. So any thoughts about, you know, what you see in his role, his leadership, uh, and the perception people have of him? Uh, yeah, he gets a lot of criticism. <laughs> um, but as far as the pandemic goes, I don't really have much to say. I mean, I can't really name a country that's been doing an amazing job at this. I mean, this is a challenge that I feel like the world has not faced too many times before. I mean, the globalization has affected us to a certain extent. Maybe the last time we had to deal with something like this was the Black Plague. Um, And with everything that's going on, I I find it difficult to criticize a leader for the way he he conducts himself when uh, tackling such an insane issue as a, uh, a global pandemic, of course, like, we can always say something, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, I tried to just lean more towards other cases that are going on. I mean, for example, this uh, Cienfuegos controversy, uh, how that's affecting the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico at the moment. Um, for anybody here, just, aware, just to be clear, you're speaking of a former general, a former Mexican mm-hmm. general, who was in the previous government, uh, the, the Minister of Defense, the highest ranking the official. Yeah. And uh, a couple of months back, uh, I don't remember exactly, he was arrested in the U.S., basically detained at the L- LAX airport, uh, mm-hmm. alle- alleged to be uh, you know, involved in drug smuggling, drug trafficking, corruption. Yeah, money laundering, um, corruption. Money, money laundering. laundering. And then the U.S. government under Trump at the time, before this, this would have been the end of the year, before the transition, basically handed him over to Mexico uh, in, in, instead of you know putting him on trial in the U.S., handed him over with the expectation that Mexico would try him, or and they provided the evidence, so to speak. Well, Mexico quickly, uh, actually the evidence that they provided was sort of put onto the internet rather quickly, a lot of text messages and things that there were said to be uh, the evidence. And eventually the Mexican government under Lopez Obrador essentially exonerated him, saying that you know the evidence was you know not sufficient. So it created a very tense moment because, again, the, the relationship was very complex and and and, uh, uh, and it comes on the heels of a whole other context where the Mexican Congress begun to limit some of the movement of drug enforcement agents in, in Mexico that have been doing this for decades now. But it is a very sensitive issue. And, of course, Lopez Obrador, you know, asserting maybe Mexican nationalism, Mexican sort of, you know, sovereignty issues is, is taking that hard line. Uh, it's interesting to see how the relationships evolve because the leaders themselves, you know, reflect part of it. But then you also have a lot of relations defined more by people to people and let's say other parts of government. And what I mean by that is you have the leaders. Today it's Lopez Obrador, today it's Joe Biden. Um, and whether they have a clique, whether they have a 
sort of a personal relationship can often do much to break the ice. And, and again, Mexico and the U.S. is a very important relationship, complex uh, on so many levels. Uh, interesting that we've seen just in these past years with all the attention to the migration crisis, the Central Americans you know, moving through Mexico. Uh, about almost two years ago, we saw under the President Trump then uh, a lot of pressure put on Mexico to sort of try to help stop that flow and threatening the use of trade war uh, tariffs, increase in tariffs if they didn't cooperate. So Mexico has done that effectively and sort of become, in the, in the eyes of some people, maybe doing the ugly work for Mex for the U.S., you know, sealing that border. Uh, mm -hmm. But interesting to see, and I wonder from your vantage point, I know all of you have been there a little bit less, but I, I know Gavin has been there longer. But today in Mexico, uh, this Central American migration issue continues to be a, a very serious one because uh, the flows have come, uh, the border was stopped for a while, and so many Central Americans have, have ended up in Mexico. Some of them have chosen it. There actually are uh, migration policies that facilitate work visas for Guatemalans, Nicaraguans, uh, and uh, Salvadorans from Honduras uh, in particular areas. Uh, and I'm just wondering, because now that you've been some time in Puebla, I mean, have you seen any, uh, I don't know, aspects of the Central American migration? And I don't know if you, you, you may not see it yourself, but David, certainly in the last year or two, when we had big waves, they were passing through the, the region and, uh, you know, just greater awareness of it. Also, there's an interesting aspect because among Mexicans, and, and you know, you all have opportunities to, to interact with, you know, fellow students and other Mexicans, there's often a lot of discrimination towards Central Americans. Uh, you know, they, they, there is uh, an element of that, too, that uh, puts, you know, a different angle on this. So just maybe talking about questions, you know, uh, like the migration crisis, the migration issue, or, as you mentioned, Davin, even, you know, sort of security policy issues between the two countries. I mean, um, where do you see the forces coming from? I mean, uh, things are pretty tense. Are they likely to stay that way? Or how do you how do you see the next you know coming months ahead? Yeah, naturally, I think this is like always going to be uh, an insanely complicated issue, and it's going to depend on specific administrations and what they want to do about it, what's important to their policy, um, what's important to the values of their administrations, et cetera, and what they ultimately what to, what what they want to do about this. Um, in my personal experience. I saw more migrants in Mexico City than I did here in Puebla. Um, I didn't, I don't think I saw any like of the caravans or anything like that. In Mexico City, I did see that once. But um, in terms of how people are treated as they're coming through, there is definitely a, an inherent hypocrisy, I think. Um, but it's not. It, it's it's not so blatant either. It's it's mostly whenever you you'll hear comments from time to time, um, but I've I've rarely seen South Americans or Central Americans be treated a specific way in my face or around like other Mexicans that I might be with. It's more so I'm in a private setting with some other Mexicans and I might hear some comments every now and again. Um, but it also just depends on the person I think and how aware they are of the issues. Uh, I can't sit here and say that all Mexicans treat Central Americans and South Americans this way uh, or any kind of like derogatory sense because they don't. Uh, but there are definitely some cases where kind of like, yeah, well, why, why do you why do you think uh, so negatively about certain groups of people, especially when they're just trying to seek a better life, uh, provide for their families or escape a, a very dangerous situation back home? Yeah. Well, no, thank you for sharing that. And listen, we're, we're winding down now in the last minute. I mean, Oliver, just as a final takeaway, I mean, uh, now that you're, you know, sort of settled in and, you know, become Mexicanized uh, in the last maybe 30 seconds, any any final thoughts to share about your experience, you know, looking at Mexico through your eyes? I, I mean, I don't really have the sort of wealth of experience of, of Mexico that uh, Davin has. Uh, and, to, and I haven't really, I haven't met migrants myself. Um, but it's something that just seems interesting is because I, I, it's not very publicized the role of Mexico in in this sort of um, in this whole conundrum in 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 the sense of Mexico acting as uh, the uh, sort of enforcer um, uh, of um, American foreign policy and American America's border policy and something that's that even though I've not really heard much from Mexicans themselves about um, views towards Central Americans there doesn't really seem to be a uh, any sort of, I guess, uh, backlash to war, or, or almost not backlash, but um, sort of, back, yeah, back, backlash towards um, Central American migration that might might exist in America, and there doesn't seem to be this sort of 
uh, want for want to play uh, this role of enforcer that America's sort of, I guess, pushing on on Mexico. That it, it seem it, it seems to me that Mexicans feel like this is something that that is being forced um, on their government uh, by th- through stuff like you know sanctions and tariffs and stuff like that. Well, thank you all. I mean, for sharing this, and again, we've just scratched the surface on some of these, but mainly some impressions, some takeaways from your experience uh, working. I'm sorry, studying, living in Mexico now. I want to thank both of you for joining me here today on Global Connections, and really, that's what it's about—just connecting the dots. Each of you coming from different parts of the planet and joining me there in, in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, thank you again for these uh, reflections, uh, and uh, wish you both well as you continue. And uh, for the rest of us, uh, stay tuned as we continue with more on the shows to come ahead. Aloha. Thank you.